All right, for those just starting to join me, bear with me for just a second. Just trying to get a couple of things last minute together here. There we go. All right. Wow. Hi, everybody. We've got Aaron Heath, Chloe Green, Penciled Imagination, and Melissa. And I'm using my husband's um, tablet, which is why you see Dagolf, my husband's name. And Diane. Hi, everybody. All right. So I want to do something first to kind of show you the form of the eye. I thought that'd be a great way to start. You can see I've got quite a few options here on my tablet. So the first one I want to show you, um, let me go to the eagle because I think this would be a good way to see this. So the reason I picked some of these eyes, this one in particular, is to show you kind of the structure. Whenever you're doing shading, all of that, this will make a lot of sense. And, and sorry about the sound of my aquarium. Hopefully it's not too loud. Um, so we've got the round shape of the eyeball itself, but what's really cool is the lens that's on the inside is flat. And then you've got, uh, or let me rephrase that, it's the, um, and Fig and Font, thank you for joining too, I just saw you pop in. Alright, so basically the pupil and the iris, so we've got the color and the black area. That is actually flat. So if you think about this as being a marble, this would be the center of the marble, sort of. And you've got the lens on top. So. I actually bought some tracing paper because I want to kind of demonstrate this a little bit. Um, so I bought it for this purpose. Hopefully my tablet will cooperate because sometimes it, when I was testing this earlier, it was acting a little funky. So if you look at the eye, you can kind of see through here. We've actually got a much larger shape for the eye itself. Let me get a darker pencil so this will make a little more sense. Okay, so you've got the shape of the eye itself. See, I was afraid that was going to happen, of the eye itself. And then you've got the eyelid. You see how that's curved? But the eye part itself, if you were to look at it, let me move this here real quick. If you were to look at the eye itself, right here, like you, as you can see it up there, um, let's say we're looking at it from below going up. So here, this would be the iris, and or the pupil, and this would be the iris right here. So then we've got the lens, pupil, and this would be the iris. And this is all the stuff you don't see. We'll just write invisible. <laughs> My terrible, terrible handwriting. Okay, so just to give you an idea. Now this is very important when you're talking about shading. So we'll get to that part later, but I really want you to see the shape of the eye. Um, so whenever you're shading, the lens itself is gonna have a curved highlight, but this part underneath here is still gonna be flat. So whenever you have the flat and the curve of your shading in there, um, which I promise will make sense when we get to that in a bit here, uh, I just wanted you to see this so you understood where that came from. So I'm not actually drawing the eagle, I just wanted to use that part. Let me back up a bit here. Um, so there's a couple of things. Uh, the individual who asked me to do this, Aaron, um, which and thank you for asking me to do this, one of the things he wanted to draw, learn, work on was a horse's eye. So I thought we'd bring this up. Hopefully you guys can see that. It's a, at an angle, so forgive me on that. But we're going to break this down into some forms here. Uh, so first of all, hopefully, hopefully you guys can see my paper okay. Whoa! <laughs> I've I've got a smaller easel that's holding a large board, so sorry it may move on me once in a while. I'm going to try to keep it from happening. So when we're looking at the shape, and I'm kind of trying to look around my camera, which is in my way. Um, so forgive me, this may not be perfect, but I'm going to use a darker pencil just so you guys can see it to start with. So. First of all, you don't want to consider what you're seeing at first so much as the shape that's inside of here. And hopefully you guys can see this okay. Is this too too narrow? Because um, I know the view that I'm looking at from my secondary tablet has a little too narrowed in. I'll get that fixed. Sorry about this, guys. Hold on. Okay, I hope that's better. All right, so... Let me get my light adjusted here a little bit too. I had an overhead light on earlier, but it was causing a lot of glare. All right, so what we wanna do is first look at the shape. So we're not looking at the eye, outside part of the eye, you're thinking about the fact that the eye is round. So we're gonna start off with a round form. And I'm gonna do this, oh, thank you so much, Melissa, for letting me know, I appreciate it. So we're gonna start off with this round form. Hi, Lauren. And 
keep in mind that the eye itself is going to be round inside of there, well at least mostly. So we're going to build up on top of this. Um, we know that our pupil is right about here and with horses they have a very unusual shape of kind of a conical and I'm just putting in some basic shapes here because you're not going to start off with a finished product. This is just to help understand it. So we've got a couple of points here where you're, you've got the outer part of the eye right here and right here. Now the reason I bring those up is just because they're pretty much opposite but right here and they go a little further outside the eye where everything else kind of fits the eye. So paying attention right here you can see that that comes down to the pupil. I've got that right here and it curves over. So just following the curve of what shape you feel that the eye is. Try to stick with your image as much as you can. And this is really hard to do at the angle that I'm at, so please forgive me. And you have the front corner of the eye, because this is where the nose is going this way. The body is this direction over here. So, All right, so, and then you start working in your curves. Don't worry too much. Uh, now, at this stage, I'm using a 4B only so you guys can see. But what you want to do is work with a much lighter pencil and just fish out the forms. So here we have the part of the eye where we have the tear ducts and everything else. And then we have the eyelid itself. So we're keeping in mind just the shape. I'm not trying to make this look pretty right now. And just get some basic shapes in there. You don't need to do anything pretty. It's not the point. It's just to get things started. So the eyelid itself has a shape and a form like this, right? So here's your cheek. This is the eyeball itself, and then here's your eyelid with your eyelashes. So I'm trying to emulate that form now. So as I'm starting to get the lower eyelid, I'm just watching where my mark is going to keep the curve as much as I can with the eye, and you'll see it kind of comes back in toward the eye up here. So that's the outer part of the eyelid, and then there's an inner part of the eyelid that goes right against the eye. When you're shading, you want to leave this part actually much lighter. And then it gets really narrow toward the tip because that's where it connects. And forgive this appearance on this one. I'm just trying to make it visible for you guys. You've got your pupil. I'm going to go ahead and just scoot that in just so there's a visual representation. Oop, don't you dare move on me, you silly thing. All right, and then you've also got the sclera. So the sclera is this part of the eye right here. And it's kind of like a third eyelid. So, sorry, I'm trying to keep my hand out of the way. You want to get that started working in here. It's at an angle. It's not going to go the same direction as everything else. See how it's at an angle? And this is a pretty deep section. And there is a tear duct here as well. And the way your shadow is going to go is down here. So I'm just marking out where the shadow is just so you can see it. And then the eyelid comes up a little bit over here. So you've got your shadow right here. You've got your tear duct here heavy shadow here. So I'm just going to shade a little bit just so you can see it. And then the actual eye starts right here, a little further in than you might expect, right? All right, so just like with the lower eyelid, how you've got the edge right there, here's your outer edge, your inner edge, and then you've got the eye lid shape right down here. Same thing happens up top. So you can see how this has a ridge right there. So I'm going to work that in too. What I've done though is I've actually already drawn the top edge up here. So we're going to work in the bottom edge. Just I'm just scribbling in here. I'll do something a little bit more pretty in a moment. And here's what happens down here. You see where this ends right here? This one overlaps and comes across. Are you sure, Miss, Mr. Mastermind? I like how you have Miss and Mr. in there. That's great. <laughs> they said uh, I'm a good teacher, and I, I, I'm hopeful I can do something that makes sense here. I just want to try and help you understand the form of this first, and then we'll get into some prettier appearance. I just want to scribble it all in there first. So something else to notice here is see how this dark ridge right along all edges? And that's because of that, that shape that I was talking about. How it's like a marble, and you've got the iris, the pupil, and this is the lens right here. So that's, you can see how that's coming into play because right here the eyelids itself actually create a heavy shadow into this part and then the lens picks up the light 
around, so you're getting a lot of reflection, you may be able to see uh, that there's actually the photographer right here. Very funny penciled imagination. Uh, it says uh, you have a real eye for it. Da -dun -dun. <laughs> and Melissa says, yeah, you're very well spoken and clear. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right. So when we're talking about there being a marble kind of a shape, so we want to get start getting the shadow here. You can see it's starting to take form. And when you're sketching the initial stages, and again, keep in mind I'm using a 4B right now solely so you can see this easy, easily. So I'm also paying attention to the shape right here of that highlight. So you'll see it starts right at the edge of where the eyelid, you can, see it, you can actually see the reflection right there of the inside of that eyelid. So that's why that starts in that shape. And then it comes across just at the top of the pupil. So always pay attention to other areas and measure from other areas. So in this case, if you look at where the pupil is, uh, it actually leaves a little space there. So that tells me that if I were to come right here, I'd be going too low. I would go a little above it. Always compare to what's around it. You see about the middle part of the pupil is where the um, highlight goes up. So that's where I'm going to start with my highlight going up. And it actually goes with the curve of the pupil. And right at the back end, here's the edge of the pupil. There is the edge of the uh, highlight. So it's just past it and it's at a slope. And you'll see how it curves, hooks out. So I'm going to follow the curve, took it out as well because this is a rounded structure. So if I were to come back in to shade it, then I would be doing all the sides here pretty heavily. The pupil would get a fair amount of shading. This would get a lot of shading, but you can see how it's brighter here on the edge. So I would actually hi uh, highlight that area if I were drawing with a lighter pencil. So in this case, an eraser works just as well. So this would, that area would get much brighter highlight. All right, so the other thing to consider is it's not just about the eyeball itself or the eyelids. It's also about, you know, right around there, it's also about the main eyelid too. So there's a lot of shape. You can see how this eyelid where it puckers out because the light we have coming down, the edge of the eyelid catches shadow or catches light and creates a shadow here too. So if I were sketching this for a painting, for instance, I would actually draw in the area where the shadow goes so that I know to paint that in later. Um, keeping in mind that this has a ridge of highlight, I would actually draw in the edge of where the highlight is. If I were doing this for painting, I would also go ahead and sketch just the basic shape of the eyelid. You can see how this, this has a muscle here. See where the brightest ridge is right through here and the muscle itself goes right, right underneath the eyelid and then curves with it. If you were to see the cheek, you would see that it actually starts right about here. So this portion of the eyelid, actually it rolls back. So you have to keep that in mind in your shape. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> so you can see that it's rolled back because when he closes his eye, of course, it comes down and it tucks into the eye it, itself. That's why you have that nice deep wrinkle. That's important so that you know where you're looking to put that eyelid and how deep of a shade that you're going to put in there too. So I'm just going to start popping out a little sucker in here and you can see how it tucks off to the side and this actually curves creating a second part of the eyelid and I'm just drawing in the forms of where the light and shadow is so I'm not trying to make this look pretty and then you can see that there's a shadow right here from where it comes down. So this would be sh shaded in pretty heavily this would have a little bit of shade here. I'm not trying to make it look pretty. All right. And then you've got your big portion of your eyebrow right up here with the horse. You can see this little curve right there. That's what I'm imitating because this gives me the sense in my initial sketch of where that is. And that's also the top part of that shadow. So I'm, I'm actually drawing in the shadow uh, outlines, if that makes sense. So if I were going to shade it, and really don't use your finger for shading, it's terrible because it puts oil on your paper. And then when you're working with graphite, graphite does create dust, and dust goes straight to your oils from your hands. So I'm gonna come in with a darker pencil just so you can see this better. This one is a 6B, uh, you probably can't see it. And normally I would use like a HB, uh, which if you look at your pencils, they at the back end usually will have a description. This one is a 6B, and excuse my hand, it's all dry today. Um, there's 
I, this is a really dark one. Anytime you have B, B means it's soft. The lead is soft. The lead will then leave more behind on the paper. H is hard. I know that's a hard one to remember, right? H for hard. Uh, the higher the number, the harder the pencil. The harder the pencil, the less graphite it leaves on the paper. So let me give you, for instance, really quick, because this is important. Um, when you're starting a drawing, it's good to start with the harder pencils. I'm going to do it right off over here. So this one is a 2H. I'm going to use the same pressure for each of these. This one is an H, slightly darker. And here's where you're going to notice a big difference. This one is a 4B, same pressure. And this one is a 6B. That's hey, even darker, even though it's not as wide. The 4B right now has more of a rounded tip than the other. So, um, But you can see the darkness there. It's much, much heavier. So now that's out of the way. I'm going to come back in just so you guys can see it with a 6B. Normally, I probably wouldn't be heavier than a 2B tops. Typically, I would start this with like an H. Anyway, so you can see I've got the form here and remember you, you can even still see the original circle still so you can see we kept within the shape of the eye because that's where the eye is it's, it's actually bigger than what we see we only see the top part of the iceberg so to speak so if I were to be coming in here to do my um, you know a much cleaner uh, sketch and somebody's asked do you ever use powdered graphite with a brush absolutely and I'm glad you actually brought that up um, I got some well it's probably too hard to do it from the angle I'm at right now um, I use I use that all the time in fact I do it with my pastel pencils too because it, it's much smoother um, like here let me just show you really quick let me find one that actually works a lot. sorry I have a lot of brushes but I need one that's not for my oils uh, I have some brushes set aside solely for doing um, pencils or similar so let me break that one up. So if, let's say, because I don't have any powdered right now that's prepared, I tend to use a sandpaper block to prep mine because it also helps me sharpen the pencil. But let's say that you've got two areas that you want to bring together. You can use a um, paintbrush to bring them together. And you can come back through with your kneaded eraser or vinyl eraser. And instead of scraping across, you can actually just press down and pull back up. That'll bring without bring it up without actually damaging or pulling up too much. Um, Melissa says I often smudge stick uh, quick sketches with a brush, uh, really smooth. If you don't have powder, I I do the same thing. I love doing that. I love that you bring that up. In fact, a, a quick way is you can you can actually just smudge a little bit on a spare piece of paper. Hopefully you can see that. And what do I do with my brush? Um, this is sometimes what I do, and then I'll, I'll come over with the brush just to pick up something. And then I'll come over here to the actual drawing and smudge on. I, I really don't have much on there because I just barely did it, but you can kind of see it. So that's what she's talking about. And it's a fantastic method. In fact, you can actually use water with graphite too. Um, and if you really want to have some fun and you have oil thinner around, thinner, uh, and make sure you always use odorless, Never use odor, <laughs> always want to use odorless. Um, so if you use that with your pencil drawing on a brush, it actually breaks down the binder in the graphite. And uh, so I find that that works really well uh, to get some really cool designs. So you can see how I've already shaded in some of this just a little bit. I'm coming back in with my brush now to bring that in. A little bit more softly and let's see Melissa also says even for really subtle values the brush alone does a trick too I completely agree Melissa is 100% right on that so I did this line right here solely for the sake of showing you where that uh, dark shadow is let me get this turn where I actually have an edge and I'm just gonna come in and start taking away that line just for the sake of making this look better okay so you saw that I have these lines here already I'm actually just using the graphite straight from those lines and I'm just going to use my brush. You can see how little effort that takes, how quickly it builds up. And I'm using a paper in this case that is, I actually prefer usually working on a watercolor 140 pound. Uh, that just simply means that it's a lightweight paper. Um, they just say, just for a quick fun lesson if you're interested. Um, basically, whenever they weigh a paper, they do it on a large roll before they cut it up. And at that stage, 
when it comes out to a dense paper, you're looking at 300 or, or higher. Uh, when it's a relatively light sketch type paper like this, this is probably like 70 weight pounds. You can see how thin it is. Um, but 140 weight cold press paper is an excellent paper to draw with. All right, so I'm just chatting away. I apologize. So again, keep in mind you're watching where your shadows are. So if we were to, and by the way, let me fix one little thing. You can see right here on the eye, oops, sorry. You can see right here on the eye where that's actually, all that eyelid is connected there. And I have a line that goes over it, so it's gonna bother me, so I'm just gonna remove that. And Miss Mr. Mastermind, I still love that. Uh, would you suggest using a brush to smudge over smudge sticks? Frankly, I would. Um, I'm with Melissa on that because I, I do it all the time. You can get so much smoother of an appearance. However, if you're dealing with a heavier line and a heavier paper, um, you may prefer a smudge stick. So to get some differentiation here, this is the under, under part of the eyelid right here you would want to start building in a little bit more depth because this is going to be in heavy shadow right down here. So you want to do it in phases, just build it up little by little. Um, you don't want to make really heavy marks whenever you're starting your building up process. So you can see it's starting to come in right up there with much darker, but there is also, you can see this bright little light right there, right? That is just a little edge of highlight where it catches a reflection off the inner part of the eyelid. That's what you call reflective light. So I've taken my kneaded eraser, pinched a little edge there, and I'll just come right in and take that back up. Because I've been using a brush, look how easily that comes up. And now if I want to thin out the line a little bit, I can just come back in with the brush. Because you can see how very subtle that is, how very thin that is. And if I wanted to accentuate it, because you can see it's pretty dark right there along the edge, um, then I can just come back in with my pencil and just very, very, very lightly. I am not pressing down. I am just little tiny circles shading in with it. And I'm looking for the darkest areas, just little circles. And you just build it up. It's, it's a process. So I'm, I'm sorry it's not like a quick process. The only quick part was just showing you how to draw how to find the forms in the eye. So you can see right here, that's got a very small bright edge and that's because that's part of the sclera and duct area. And you can see how that kind of punches out a little bit and a little bit of a rounded shape. So I'm gonna bring that back in too. And then you just keep bringing up your brush and continuing with your shading. And Melissa says, smudge sticks sometimes leave dark marks. You're more likely to push the graphite into the grain. But that's my experience. She's correct. That is exactly what happens. And I, like her, I prefer the brush myself because it is so much smoother. It's easier. It's also easier to correct. Uh, anytime you're working at the beginning stage of drawing, do not draw hard. That's uh, Again, I only used the darker pencil for the sake of showing. I use H's and the way I tend to hold it, you see how my hand is, my terrible looking hand. Um, I just very lightly, like a drummer almost, and I don't know if you can even see those lines. That's, that's the way that I start off drawing. I do my circle, my shape, I was doing a face for instance, and then I start to bring it in little by little. And then I have my marks and I come back in with a darker pencil. So always start soft because you can't, once you've scored the paper, like Melissa brought up, once you've scored the paper, you can't really, let me sh let me give you for instance, if I were to come back in and draw really hard right there, I've scored the paper. If I were to come in and erase it, look at that, I can't even erase all of it because it's gotten into the paper. It's actually a divot in the paper. Let me see if I can turn it over and you'll see. You might be able to see a little bit of the edge right here. That's actually where it cut into the paper. That's what happens when you start too heavily, too hard. So there's no reason to jump to the hard uh, line marks. Just start off really, even if you do a higher number of pencil, like a 6B, if you hold it like this, very gently, like you're conducting, a, um, conducting an opera, and then you can do your forms. Uh, so hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, but anyway, remember what we're looking at for the eye. We're studying the anatomy here. We've got the circle of the eye itself. Think of it as a marble. In the middle of the marble you've got the, I guess you could say the landmass, like we've got up here. This is the circle of the eye. We've got the iris, um, yeah, the iris here. We've got the pupil in the middle. This is a side view. 
So if we had the eyelid, it would be coming out here and here. So I'll just give you an idea. Um, so always think about it like that. So if you're doing your shading, uh, your shading would actually come in more straight on and then your highlights would have a curve. You can see this one has a curve to it. Um, that actually gives it much more of an effect. So let me, let me flip to another picture and I'll show you what I mean about the shape. Some of these I picked solely for that purpose. Um, there's this one, if it'll come up here. There we go. So you can see the shape, how it's curved out. So I'm going to flip to another sheet here, and we'll just do this one as well. So this, this is a different angle of another, it actually may be the same horse for all I know. Um, I'm going to do a little bit lighter this time. All right. So you can see I'm holding it. Oh no, did it freeze up? Sorry, Melissa. Melissa said that Instagram froze. Um, hopefully, hopefully it didn't affect you guys too bad if it was on my end. All right, so looking at the horse shape again, we're thinking of the eye as a circle. So we're going to start it off with a circle. See, I'm doing much lighter this time. Hopefully you can see that okay. Oh, thank you so much, Memory Lane. I appreciate that. So I want to point out here, if you can see where the pupil is, it's a little hard to see probably for you guys, but it's at an interesting angle. And it's slightly curved. So because a horse's pupil is a funky little cylinder, Oh, good, Melissa. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, she said it was just on her end. All right. So the pupil is kind of at a funky little angle, but if you look at the circle of it, it kind of starts about the middle. So if I were to start sketching, I would do a little circle for one end of it, another circle for the other end of it, and then connect them. And that way I can get approximately the right position. So if we think of this as a circle, as a ball, not just a circle, but as an actual ball, you can see how the horse's eyelid goes with the shape. So, paying attention to where the pupil is, you can see the edge of the pupil right there, and the edge of the eye here, I'm also measuring about the same with getting my lower lid. So I'm just gonna do a very light, right through there. You can see the edge of the pupil here, and straight down here, uh, think of it that it's the angle, think of it as a measurement right here. It's actually about the same length. So we've got the edge of the pupil to the, where my finger is, the tip of the pencil, turn it, and the edge of the, see it lines up exactly the same. So if I were to do it from here to here, just like up there, I can mark right there for where my, the inner tear duct area goes. So always measure everything against each other. And same thing up above. So you can see that the same height here to here on the eye. So that's where I'd start my upper eyelid. Now remember, it's a curved surface. So that means I'm going to yet again curve across the top and it meets right there, tucked together, in a nice little, almost a point. And horse eyes have this fun little curve right there at the top. They look all pouty sometimes. You can see how it comes in close to the edge of the eye before it puckers back out to the tear duct. So I'm drawing fairly lightly this time by comparison. And you can see widens out. Now again, considering the shape of the eye, it's the eyelid itself, it's not just a simple, you know, flap like that. You know, you've got your eye and then there's a flap. No, it's the eye, inner eyelid, outer eyelid, and then it goes down. So just to give you an idea. So I'm going to keep that in mind and I'm going to sketch the outer eyelid again. So it is narrower in some areas than others, especially when you get close up here to the edge of the eye. And then, if you can see this right here, it's maybe difficult for you guys to see, there's actually the edge of the iris, and it just it forms a semicircle. So we're just gonna start working that in. And then we've got the shadows really heavy here, right? So I'm gonna draw in where the shadow goes and literally just only look at the shape of the shadow. It looks like a boomerang. I mean, that's the best thing I can describe it as. And we've got the sclera there, so I'm gonna mark the sclera. All right, so if we're looking at it like the shape of a boomerang, it comes in about the same shape as the eye and goes and hides in the eyelashes, but I know it's there. And Melissa says, God, yeah, some horses really have a frown going on. Oh, do they look pitiful sometimes, but to be fair, they, they love to get themselves hurt on anything and everything that's possible. Uh, anybody who's had a horse will tell you they're, we, you know, it, the joke is they're suicidal. You are struggling to keep them alive. <laughs> 
Anyway, so I'm, I'm looking here at each section as its own form. So by doing that, you see this highlight through here? It's actually got its own shape. Um, this shadow up here has its own shape. Same thing with this different color of a highlight right there. So if you think about it, breaking it down in shapes like that, then it makes the eye a lot easier to see. So I'm going to draw this shape right here first. It actually cuts into the pupil and then comes right down here and then does another shape that goes along with the eye. And then it curves up and curves back around over here. So that's that highlight. I've already got the pupil in. And then we've got the shadow down here marked in. Now, look at this shadow. That one marks where the eyebrow blocks the light and the eyelashes block the light. So it lines up already with this lighter shadow or lighter highlight right here. So the one we've already drawn, it starts there and then comes around and cuts right at the end of where the pupil is. And then just goes straight down because it, it actually goes on to the surface of the eye itself, the iris. So we've got that part and keep in mind we've also got the inner eyelid which you don't see a whole lot of extra stuff on it usually. And it puckers out where the tear ducts are. So we're starting to get the shape. Now, as always, it's more than just the eyeball itself. You need the eyelids to look right too. So I'm just chasing down the shape of the eye itself. And so we've got muscle here, and we've got the bottom edge of that muscle there. So we'll come up over here, and you notice how this actually tucks over the eyelid itself. This is kind of an eyebrow, I guess you could say. I forget the official name for it. So this edge right here is basically at this spot. I do not have the eyelashes drawn in. So if we're looking at that and where the light hits, we're going to come right up here. And first of all, let me get the eyelid itself here. So see how it's curved right there going with the shape of the eye we've already got our circle so it's easy to find that shape and now that secondary eyelid comes right here but it's flat see how flat that is so I'm not comparing it to the other parts of the eye I'm just trying to pop it right in because I don't want to make it too rounded now then if you've got this pretty straight then how do you make this look curved right and that's because above it it has a shadow that works in your favor to get that appearance. All right, now you can see this also has a shadow and a shape. See how it looks like a lazy L? Just pay attention to that. It's a lazy L. I'm just gonna work it in. And you can see at the bottom of the L, right starts actually right at the edge where the tear duct stuff comes in and meets where the bottom eyelid comes in. Now I know this looks like a bunch of crazy shapes and forms, but when you start mapping where everything is, when it's time to start shading, it's going to make so much more sense. And then, of course, the eyebrow up here at the top, where they always look so miserable, comes right up over here, because you can see where this lines up right here. So it comes up higher and then comes down. So we can start getting the shape again. See how this looks like a flexed arm, like the bicep? I'm just trying to compare it to something else. So think about flexing it. And I'm just literally drawing where the lights and the darks are. If I were to come in now with a brush to, you know, as Melissa uh, was bringing up and I've brought up as well um, with her wonderful segue, you can now come in with your brush and start bringing in your shading. You're going to have areas that are brighter, um, you know, than the shadows. So you can see right here on the eye how that inner part of the eye has a shadow, but it's much brighter than that section. So I'm just going to shade this part just a little bit here, just so I can get my brush to work. I'm very, very, very lightly touching it. I just don't have any powdered graphite right now. And how you get that to appear correct is by contrast. You need a contrasting of light and dark. So right at the edge of that eye, I'm just going to very, very gently come in and just pull up a little bit of that graphite. As you can see, the eraser got away from me just a little bit. All right. And get that edge built up just gently. You do not need to use hard pressure. 
Penciled Imagination asks, random question, do you ever change your reference photos to black and white when only drawing in graphite? You know, that's a fantastic segue. Let me show you a couple of things that I do. I do indeed sometimes do that to black and white. Uh, another little trick, let's say that you're having trouble picking your colors. Let's say that it's a difficult image where you're not sure what color is actually in that shadow. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. What you do is bring up your your light um, color, all that good junk. I don't know if you have a Apple or an Android. Let me bring this where you can see it a little better. Hopefully that's a little clearer. Hopefully you don't have too much glare. Okay, there we go. So what I would do, I've got a bug on. Let me move that, sorry. All right, so I bring my color up, and if you load your saturation all the way to the top, you'll see how much warmer that is. Look how blue that is in the eye. Look how blue that is on the eyelid. And even right here in the shadow, it's very blue. Um, and how bright red and yellow some of these areas are in gray um, versus now if I take it back down to the original color, now it looks very dull, right? But you can see all those colors. They're, they're still a nice blue in there. So whenever you're drawing with colored pencils, pastels, this is a great little trick using your saturation bar and moving it all the way to the top to help you pick your colors. Uh, conversely, when you're drawing black and white, move the saturation all the way down and you will have your black and white. Now it's a good idea to go in and do some adjustments with your highlights. And that's highlight here. You can see the difference. Um, you can change your shadows, darker, lighter. I usually do it a little lighter. And your whites. You want to lighten up your whites so that you can see things a little more clearly. So this is an easy way then to work on when you're working on black and white to get your contrast. And if I back up, discard, Ta -da, now it's back to normal. I hope that made sense. Um, but I find that that makes things a lot easier if I'm struggling with a color um, or an image to get the correct color that I want. All right, so I, I, hopefully it makes sense here with the horse eye. I want to go to another type of eye as well because a horse eye is dramatically different from something else like a, like a dog or a cat. Um, let's see, which one should we do? What do you guys want to do, a dog or a cat now? I like Melissa's, uh, or be lazy like me and don't do anything. That's hilarious. I love it. I do that too sometimes. But if I have a really, I have one sometimes that will struggle um, to pick a color, and that's just a really easy way to do it. All right, so let's see. If we do, let's do a cat. This one's an interesting eye. Um, if you can see that, hopefully you can see that okay. So let me grab a different pencil because that one is starting to run out. Oh, a dog. Sure, I can do a dog. Let's do that. Um, let's see, which one should I do? Let's do this big guy. He's got some pretty eyes. So let me zoom in a little bit. And Pencil Imagination says cat, cat, cat. Well, Miss Mr. Master might beat you to it. <laughs> we'll do a cat next. I'm going to work on, again, just the shape and structure to help you build that up. And then we'll go to the cat and do that, too. Um, we're not trying to get finished drawings right now. So that's um, it's just to help you find the form. So just like with the horse, the eye is round. Oh, and Melissa says, honestly, I haven't drawn anything today, but these horse references you posted really got me out of a rut. So just a quick thank you for that. Well, I'm glad to hear it. And join me on Saturday, and we're going to do some together. In fact, if uh, if you use the uh, the ones that I've posted, we're going to start off with the front frontal face, uh, where the you see just straight on the front of the brown horse. And then we'll do one of the other more interesting ones after that. All right, so we're going to, just like before, remember, the eye is round. Yeah, this one may be too dark. Let me, I'm just going to grab my good old trusty, and this thing is probably a good 10 plus years old, Pentel 5 millimeter, 0.5 millimeter. Oh, no. I think my lead's about out on this one. Hold on, it's got another one in it. Do, 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 do. The boring stuff. Okay, so this one should be an HB, I believe should be a little easier to see as well. All right, and by the way, for those joining a little bit later into the cast, don't worry, I'm gonna include this on my story as well as my YouTube. Um, and all right, so the dog. Just as before, we're looking at the shape of the eye being round. It helps to start with your round form. If you're familiar with drawing people, you know, sometimes you do your circle and you have your line with the direction your face is going, right? You can do similar with dogs. So we know that he's looking toward the front with the pupil. So we've got the center point of the pupil about here and 
kind of looking curved. So right about there, it helps you with figuring out where your pupil is. So that's one way to do that. I like to start with the circle just by itself most times. And then I look to see where the front of the eyelid is. I look to see, I like to just make a little mark. And I like to look to see where about the back end of the eye, eyelid is. And then looking at the shape, I just kind of start putting in a little bit of a line, nothing too crazy, just to mimic a little bit of the forms that I'm seeing with the eyelid shape. And just keep it very gestural. Don't start doing hard lines until you get a little further on. Now you can see the bottom eyelid on dogs, and this is typical, um, actually kind of comes up a little bit over where the line is. Uh, you can see where my circle for the eye is there. The eyelid itself is going to come a little bit over it and then curve out. So one of the things I find is if you do almost like a V, so you start off with the inner one, tends to curve up, and the other one tends to curve down. So it would be like this, and they just kind of meet. And then if you bring them together a little bit more gently, then it gives you your inner, your lower eyelid. I hope that makes sense. Same thing with the other, um, right here on the outer edge. So you've got the bottom one comes up, and tucks into the upper eyelid at the back edge. So it does like this. I hope that made sense. <laughs> so if you watch how these things interact with each other, same thing happens on the back end of the eyelid as it does on the front end. So the frontmost portion right here tucks over, comes over the bottom eyelid. So you'll see that it comes down here and this tucks in. So if you pay attention to how these things come together, then it makes it drawing this a lot easier. So also, again, like I've said before, if you measure everything within, compare it to everything else, so in this case, look how far of a distance or how little distance there is here. So let's say that, let's assume that this is my pupil here. I'm just gonna go ahead and draw this in for the sake of just visual being able to see it. So here's your pupil. All right, notice there's a wide area of the eye over here and notice how the shape is not exactly spherical. That's the way dogs are. Their eyes are not perfectly, when it comes to the shape of the iris, they are wonky shaped. <laughs> Do not trust it. But you'll see that at least on this side right here, it's parallel to the shape of the, the iris. So here you've, or the pupil. So here you've got that shape right there on the pupil. And it mimics only this part of the eye right there. And it turns into, a, there's a little edge where it's a little boxy toward the bottom part, like that. And you'll see how it's got a completely different angle here because of the third eye uh, lid. So they actually have another eyelid that goes right there. So I'm starting in that edge. And you can see how he's looking up toward the top. How do you get that appearance? It's the highlights. Highlights and positions of the shadows. So he's got highlights right here. I'll just go ahead and draw them in just so that I have something to judge against other things. Um, so, see the, how this is shaped and the angle this is actually compares to just this little tiny stretch right there. So right here is what I'm talking about and right here. Those actually mimic each other. And then you get the shadow of the eyelid and it starts to come in. So I'm going to just go ahead and toss that in there just for a visual. Alright, so here we have our third eyelid. Here's the outer eyelid. So third eyelid the outer eyelid curves over that and tucks down. The bottom eyelid comes in and tucks underneath. So, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, throat's getting dry. So if I were to come in and shade this later, I'm keeping in mind that this shape curves almost like, you know, it just, it curves like that. The bottom part curves under though, right? So, see how it cups out. Maybe that's a better word for it. Um, so here we've got the outer part of the iris. We've got the white part of the eye and it follows the same shape at the top. So we're going to do down and it mimics the shape a little bit of the iris. Hopefully that's making sense. And then you have the eyelid itself. So we'll start to draw in this is, see how this has got a light area right here? This is actually just, it's just kind of fleshy, so I'm just sketching where that is because it helps me identify where everything goes. So I'm just drawing literally the outline of the bright area. 
And then this is part of the eyelid curves because there's a heavy shadow there. I actually am just drawing the outline of where the shadow goes. All right, so this eyelid actually comes out a fair amount over the iris and the lens. So you get a heavy shadow. That whole section is just a dark shadow and it's its own shape. So again, paying attention to that shape and I know you can still see a little bit of the round circle I drew initially for the eye. It's still keeping to that form too. So I'm literally just drawing in the actual form of the shadow and paying attention to how it curves and how it comes in. So you can see how it stops right there at that edge. See how it lines up with the pupil? So that tells me that my pupil is actually out of place just a little bit. So it would actually be just a slight bit bigger like that. And the line for the shadow would actually come in right about there. Okay, so that's the shadow. And then the eyelid itself is above it. You can see the shape. It's very similar in shape. Okay, something else I noticed here. Um, you can see that kind of the topmost ridge is right there and it lines up almost with the outside part. So I should have my ridge there. See what I mean about comparing to other areas? So I would actually move my curve that way and start bringing it down. And to make that a little more clear, I'm gonna go in with my eraser just to remove some of that so you can see a little clearer. There we go. All right, so again, this is just helping us find the forms right now. Okay. So if I were to come in into shadow and shading and all of that, I would just build it up very gradually. This is um, so, cause this exercise right now is just solely for finding the forms of the eye. All right, you can see up here how the eyelid actually has less hair around the eyelid itself. And you can see right there how it has little edge. So I'm paying attention to these little details and where they're at. See how it is compared to where the pupil is. It's just a little past the pupil. So right here comes that eyelid edge. And it would just go straight up and I'm just following the forms and shapes of the fur, the shadows, and the highlights so that when I come, if I were to come back later and finish drawing on this, I would do so by just building up, sorry, I'm grabbing other pencils here. I would do so by building up just gradually. Never start pressing down too early. And I'm just shading a little bit right here solely for the sake of my brush having something to actually move. So that would be the brightest highlight, or sorry, deepest shadow. And if I had any errors, I would fix it at this stage while I'm still drawing very gently. Here we go. And this is very dark right here, but I'm not gonna go dark yet. You never start too dark. Once you do, you can't go back. You can go darker, but you can't go lighter. Let's see, Penciled Imagination says, I want to thank you for doing this. You've inspired me to do my own eye study this weekend. It's my favorite thing to do on portraits, but I've never really delved into just the eyes. It's a great way to help you start to see really the forms. And I, I thank you very much for saying that. Um, uh, always pay attention to the forms and the shapes of things. Look at this lower eyelid, for instance. If you, if you pay attention to the fact that if it's a round surface, that means it's gonna be darker down here on this part lighter in this section and because of where the light shading is let me just do it really quick i'll show you what i mean i'm just going to put a little bit of this in here all the way through solely for the sake of showing you what i'm talking about so hold on with me just one second all right let me get a little more in down here so looking at the shape knowing that it's rounded i'm going to first go ahead and blend this in because this will be more visually apparent when i do that so this is a lower eyelid. We know that it's dark right through here because this dog has a particularly dark edge. So I'm just gonna go ahead and come in dark. Notice how it comes up a little bit over where the edge of the iris is. And it actually has a little divot right there, a curve here. And then we have the inner third eyelid. Now, this is curved right there at the edge so that it meets the inner eye. Okay, so my reason for doing that is this. So, you see that the brightest area is right here. And just so that it makes a little more sense, it's really, 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 really bright along the edge right as it meets the eye. And then it dulls out a little bit 
closer toward the skin. So that's why I wanted to go ahead and darken this so that it'll be a little more obvious. And I can always fix any issues if I get it too light in one area or the other with my brush. So in this case, actually, I'm going to go a little bit brighter right along the edge. And then it starts to very gently come up closer toward the eye. And then it just loses some of its brightness the closer toward the eye shadow that it gets. So it's really bright here. And I didn't go dark enough for you to really see it too in depth. And then goes really, really dark right down here. So I'm just going to start building that up a little bit. Normally, if I were doing a real drawing, I would actually be going with the direction of the hairs. So bear with me. I'll just do a little scribbling here. I promise this would make sense if I were doing this a little bit more like my usual drawing. Okay, so you can see how dark that is right there. I would... I drew the form in so that I could see where that form is. You can see also that the bottom part of the eyelid right at the edge, if you look at the edge of the highlight next to the pupil, it comes down right there and then goes dark. So that's what I'm doing right here. That's the edge of my highlight, that's the edge of my shadow, and I'm bringing it, bringing it in. It's also just a bit darker right here at the bottom edge of that eyelid, but I still have my brightest spot right there. Does that Hopefully that's um, visual where you can you can see it well enough. Um, I don't know if my camera shows it clearly enough, but anyway, the whole point is just to be able to bring out your shapes and your forms first, and then you start shading. All right, Melissa says, question: What method of measuring do you feel is most effective? Imagine straight lines. Uh, and imagining straight lines and see where the shapes line up or using the pencil and thumb to compare distances. You can do a little of both, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Hi Ramke, thank you for the wave. Um, I tend to use other parts of the drawing, like comparing just, it, well I guess you could say straight lines because you kind of see me drawing it, like uh, the edge of where the shadow is comes right outside the edge there of the highlights, see what I mean? just at a little bit of an angle. The ridge of that eye, upper eyelid right here lines up right where it ends with the shadow lines up right here with the edge of the eye. So you can see where I brought it down to. Um, so yeah, I, I compare everything to itself. Um, actually, whenever I'm drawing, and, and you'll see this if you uh, check out my the horse drawing that we're going to do um, Saturday you'll see a little bit more so how I compare everything. It's a little harder on a smaller subject like an eye. Um, but I, I have a tendency of thinking of the darks and the lights, like here would be a line for the dark. I, I, I compare the shape and form of those dark areas to the light areas. Where they're positioned, what size they are, where they start, where they end. Like looking at the shadow right here, if I were to draw it in, I'll show you what I mean. Because you can see underneath the eye where it is and the shape that it takes comes right up here and widens out, flares out there, connects with this one where it curves and then curves here. So I'm, I'm literally comparing the shapes of where the light fur is, which is right here, to where the dark fur comes in. And then there's another patch of light fur here. Like I'm literally just looking at them as shapes instead of as a dog. Um, I find that that makes things easier. Sometimes I'll draw, like seeing how this has got a rounded form, I would probably draw a circle here and then cut off the edge and, you know, it's, it's hard to explain, but I find that looking at everything as a form, separate, where you're comparing, contrasting the um, negative space even compared to the positive space. Negative space would be an area outside of what you're drawing. In this case, if the eye is the main subject, the negative space would be the fur around it and the eye would be the positive space. But really, when you're talking about things like portraiture, if you're looking at a, at a human comparing where the neck is to the shoulder, for instance, this would be, this is like, let's say this is the neck and this is the shoulder here and you know, you've got your clavicle, all that good junk and here's your head. Okay, so this area would be the negative space and where the body is would be a positive space. I do that using the lights and the shadows of the fur uh, in order to get an image um, together. I, I wish I had a better one to show you right now. But I, I find that that really makes things easier, especially when you're talking about an animal that has a lot of different patches of fur of different colors. Um, using those colors as shapes 
really helps identify. Like if you're looking at this eagle, for instance, I would look at the, I would take the eye, you know, you've got a longer section right here at the front and right here at the back of where the eye comes together, the basic pupil, the ridge there, I'm knowing that where the pupil is by comparison, the top part of the eyelid, and then you have by comparison where the edge of the ridge they have, because they have this little shadow ridge. And you can see that it ends almost almost where the end of the eye itself does. So just a constant comparison back and forth I find really helps just to all different types of shapes. Um, let me pull up one of the horses. Hopefully I don't have anything bad in my stuff here. <laughs> but I'll just show you a horse for instance um, comparing the different forms. Melissa, the struggle is real. That's what she says and I agree with her. <laughs> so just I'll just go ahead and jump into a little bit of this as a preview for Saturday, I've got five minutes left. I look at the shape here. Uh, I always like to start with a circle. I know it's tedious and classic, but here's your circle. This encompasses the cheek, it encompasses the top of the brow. So if I do that, and looking at the position, so here's the circle, here's the circle. So they're not very far apart. You could do it that way, and do your line up where the top part meets, bottom part meets. There's all kinds of ways to do that. You know where your eye is, right about here, your other eye here, and then that gives you your your triangular shape across. So just finding the forms. This will make more sense whenever I do the real thing Saturday. Um, but look how fast I can bring this together now. Looking just at the shapes. Shape of that, so like a box, you know? So bringing the forms together. Just to show you how quick you can do it whenever you do the shapes themselves. So if I were just doing a gestural, um, a gestural, this would be kind of along the lines of what I do. I do a circle for the eye, start bringing in the shape, and I'm just comparing constantly to itself. So it just gives you an idea of what I'm talking about by looking at the forms and just comparing them. Uh, it, it, you just have to practice it. Just look at the shapes you're looking at. Start with a basic shape. Find your basic form first. Find your direction, your angles and just to give you an idea. So now um, it's about the end of the hour. Um, anybody else have any other questions? So uh, well, we have a, like a minute left. <laughs> if you have any particular things you'd like me to cover too with the horse, um, let me know and I'll just flip back through real quick for others that view later. This being the initial eye that we did of the horse, the secondary view, um, the dog, and then the horse head. Uh, Mr. Miss Mr. Mastermind, I love saying that. Uh, do you ever do studies of the planes of the face? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I, it's actually bringing that up. What she's talking about is where you have your typical form, and then you're thinking of the brow, like kind of like this. So you've got. I'm, I'm just doing a really obvious shape here, so it stands out. So the planes of the face being where the eyes come in. Um, so you can see where the nose and all that good junk go. It's, it's literally doing the forms of the face. And I'm actually doing much the same whenever I'm doing the eye that I showed you, the horse that I just showed you. It's really along the same line with the initial gesture. And then you start looking at the shapes of everything as you bring it in tighter and tighter and tighter. You always start with a larger overall view of the image, you know, your, like your circle, and then just bring the image tighter and tighter together that being kind of a horse, um, by doing that and tightening it up little by little, starting light touch and then going gradually medium tone and then darker tone, you always want to build up because as soon as you go too dark, as we looked at right there, um, you'll find that it, you, you can't go brighter again, but you can certainly go darker. So it's always a soft, gentle touch first and then bring in your shading little by little and uh, find your forms as you go before you get really heavy handed too. That's the safest way to go about it and finding the forms, finding the shapes, piecing them together as you go before you start doing any of the major detail work. Anyway, um, I'll see you guys tomorrow for those that want to join me. Melissa says, got no questions. I just want to thank you for the delightful live stream. Definitely learned some stuff I had no clue about. Well, I'm glad I could help. And thank you for the smiley face ram key and Mo FISD. I'm glad you joined. I'll be working on your dog tonight, actually. 
Um, so I'll send you a picture probably Saturday because I want to do a little more work on it then too. Because um, I love Biscuit. He's a lot of fun to work on. And Miss Mr. Mastermind, this has been amazing. Thank you for the streaming. Thank you guys. And I literally have 15, 10 seconds left. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. For those of you joining me tomorrow, I'll see you then. And this will be on my story and on my YouTube channel.